Word of God today, excited about it, and as we continue on with our Lovers of God series. I don't know about you, but I've been enjoying Lovers of God. Anybody else been enjoying this series? You know, here in the house, those that are watching online as well, people are, are logged in, watching, and it's, a, um, it's one of those series, I believe, that we can all identify with some shape, form, or fashion of of the word we've been preaching and just some things we've been going over in our lives. But how I many know when God does something for us or he brings that type of uh, correction, how I many know he still loves us? Amen? I just want to start off with that. God still loves us. And I want to, I want to go back to last week. If you were here, we talked, we ended. I didn't get through all my, my, my notes and everything, but we're just going to do a continuation. And we ended with the story of David. You guys remember that one, David and Bathsheba? And we ended off where David uh, repented, turned his heart back towards God. And I want to go back to the prophet Nathan that came and told David the story about what was going on because he had to speak David's language about what David had did. And just a a quick recap, if you've never heard that story, uh, it's an amazing story. So many different lessons, I believe, are in that story with David and Bathsheba. Uh, but this is where, you know, David committed sin, committed adultery, uh, then committed murder, and then lied about it, and all this this stuff that we think none of us would ever do. Anybody ever tell a lie? Look, somebody's right. Yeah, I told one today. Said, no, I'm talking. But David did some crazy stuff, and then God loves him so much that he sent the prophet Nathan to tell him a story uh, to where David could understand what was going on. And at the end of that story, you know, uh, the prophet looks at, at David and says, thou art the man. Now, in your mind, when you see that prophet coming in and, and talking to David and saying, hey, David, you're the one who did this. Thou art the man. How do you imagine the inflection of his voice? You ever think he said, thou art the man. Or did he say something like, thou art the man? Hmm? How many ever got mad at somebody and accused them? Well, they did something like, man, and, and you, you raised your voice. You see, we've all been there. And God is such an amazing God, and his love is so deep for us. I believe with all my heart, when God is calling us to turn back towards him, He's not yelling at us, but he's using that voice as, as, as I believe Nathan's voice was, David, thou art the man that got him to think about what he did and brought repentance into his life. And so I, I want to use that because I want to segue into Revelation and before anybody gets scared or anything like that, uh, but this is, uh, this is some letters that we're written to the church, and if we go to Revelation chapter 2, if you've got your Bibles, or if you're taking notes, you want to write this down, and please go back and reread this for yourself and ask the Holy Spirit to show you what he wants to teach you in this moment. Everybody with me say Revelation. Revelation. Y'all ever get into that bait? Some people say Revelations, like plural, and it's just it's one, okay? So we'll go. So Revelation chapter 2, the message of the the message to the church in Ephesus, and this is going to be real good, guys. We're going to dive in this together. So it says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Everybody say Ephesus, because that's a cool word. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work. Everybody say hard work. And your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. He's talking to the church. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. Now, that sounds like he's writing that letter and he's coming along and he's praising them. Y'all get that out of that? He's kind of... He's kind of leading with the good stuff. You know, kind of like when you try to, when you bring correction or if you're dealing with a team member or something like that, how I many know you want to lead with good points? 
before you body slam anybody. <laughs> you, you, you want to point out some good qualities. And that's the nature of humanity, and we get that from God. He's, he's pointing out the good stuff, David. He's saying, hey, you know, I, I've seen your patience, your endurance, your hard work. Uh, you, you don't tolerate evil. Uh, it's almost like if he's coming here, hey, Bridges, I see what you're doing, your consistency, you, you love other people, you, you're doing this, and, 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 and you're, you're diving into the word of God. I applaud you for all of that. Goes on to say, once again, he said, you, you found out these, these, these false apostles, and, and you discovered they're liars, so you're not tolerating that. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting, meaning you're going the extra mile. You're, you're, you're still living your life for me. He said, you suffered for me without quitting. So I applaud you for doing all of that. But then he gets ready to body slam. Everybody say body slam. So <laughs> it's the truth. This is what he does. He gets ready to, I don't know if it's body slam or what, like power drive. So body, that's what it is. <laughs> Suflex. So I'm going back to my wrestling days. Wrestling when it was real, okay? The real wrestling, you know? So he goes in, in verse 4, he goes, but I have this complaint. Uh-oh, ooh, nobody likes complaints. I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. I mean, no, that's a big complaint. He says, you're doing everything right, but you're, you're not in love with me like you used to love me. Nor do you love others like you used to love them. And I want to pause right there. I'm going to go to another scripture. It's not on the, the big screen. Uh, I don't want to mess my son up back there. Y'all give it for Grayson. He's back there running pro presenter in the house. But when I think about that, he said, you don't have love for me. You don't love me like you used to love me. Nor do you love others like you used to love them. When you first met me. In Matthew chapter 24, it talks about this. And when the disciples were asking Jesus, hey, when, are, when is going to be the signs of the last days when you're coming back in your glory? And, and Jesus begins to go and gives them this detail. And in Matthew chapter 24, write this down, take notes. You want to go back and read that whole chapter. But I'm going to jump down to the verse 10. Uh, Jesus is telling them all these things that are going to be going on. He says, and then many will be offended and repelled and will begin to distrust distrust and desert him whom they ought to trust and obey. They will fall away and they will stumble and betray one another and pursue one another with hatred. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive and lead many people into error. Verse 12, this is what I want to zone in on. He says, and the love of the great body of people will grow cold because of the multiplied lawlessness and iniquity in the land. You ever get frustrated when you watch the evening news and all of a sudden this hatred rises up because we're human? The tragedy that just happened at Belmont 18 year old girl out walking senseless, senselessly took a straight bullet in the head how many and then when you hear the backstory how many know that's those are moments where the love can grow cold as Heather I was like somebody needs to be held accountable for that why was this guy even out on the street? And then, and then, and then you get, you ever find yourself, because we're human. It says, the love of the great body of people will grow cold because of the lawlessness that is in the land. I mean, we can't get caught up in that. It's tempting and it's real. Very real. To judge and, and, and you almost feel that emotion of hatred coming up on the inside. And the love of the great body of people will grow cold because of the multiplied lawlessness and iniquity. But he who endures to the end will be saved. And this good news of the kingdom, the gospel, will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. We've got to 
We've got to go back and how do we guard against our love growing cold? Growing cold towards God and growing cold towards one another. This is the reality that we live in today. And Jesus came and the word of the Lord to this church in Ephesus, you've left me. I've got this complaint. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Everybody say at first. You remember, especially if you're a married couple or you ever dated anybody, and when you first met them, how do you know? It's like they're all you thought about. Nobody wants to say anything right now because especially married people in the house. <laughs> they're all you thought about. You talked about them all the time or you're dating somebody new and you're always talking about them. And then as time, everybody says time goes on. I mean, no, <laughs> that's when you realize love is not a feeling, it's a commitment. Amen? It's a commitment. And you've got to go back and you've got to take that trip down memory lane. We, Heather and I do that often. We'll find an old picture of one of our kids when they were babies. And we'd be like, oh, you remember that? And when things were awesome, <laughs> you know, and they... they <laughs> They, they, they couldn't go nowhere. They were just in their diapers, and they needed us. And, oh, man, and we just we relive those moments, and it's all, yeah. And, and we still love them, but it's like as time goes on, you've got you to work towards that love. And I guarantee you, as time goes on with your relationship with God, you've got to work for that. You, 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 you've got to be intentional about that because this is what happens. He said, I've got this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Verse 5, look how far. This is where we're going to take a little trip together, guys. We've got to be honest. If we're going to uh, reestablish and maybe, maybe reignite our passion and our love for God. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. Everybody say at first. Now, that's the, that's the simplicity of it. Turn back to me. And do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. Wow. Wow. If you don't change, if you don't come back to me, if you don't repent, I'm going to come and remove the light from you guys. That's deep. That's a, if you were to read that, you'd almost be like, man, is that a threat? That's a bold threat. Like, if you don't do something, I'm going to remove my presence. I'm going to remove my light. Because although I, he's saying, although I'm excited about all the things you're doing, nothing should take the place of you loving me. The first love. So let's go back on this journey in verse 5. It says, look how far you've fallen. Look how far you've fallen. And this is where we've got to take that journey uh, and ask ourselves a few questions. And if you're taking notes, write these down, listen to the video again later, and you can go back and rework this. But what's taking his place in my heart? What's taking his place with my affection? What's taking his place with my attention? What's taking his place with my time? Now, we usually think if somebody's fallen, we think, oh, man, they committed some horrible Maybe some horrible sin. They really messed up this, this huge transgression as if there were a scale for transgression. I've never found a scale in the Bible of transgressions. Is there a degree of transgression? Is there a degree of sin? So we think of fallen. What's taking the place? I was doing good and something has tripped me up. Something has gotten in the way of my affection that I used to have when I first turned to God. What is it that, is, that has gotten in the way? I mean, as time goes on and we begin to lose our affection and we begin to, to go through the motion and we don't put our whole heart into loving God. Or even it's real simple to let a church service replace your affections for God and your love for God because we're thinking I'm doing something for him 
But how often, as I was talking to Patrick, I said, man, we want to start creating even more moments where we can just love God and not be worried about time, where we can just love God and get in his presence in these moments where we feel ourselves falling in love with him again. Because if not, here's the thing. He says, it's a complaint I've got against you. You don't love me. That's a bold statement. You don't love me. Usually when somebody says, I don't think you love me like you used to, I don't know what are you talking about. I do. But the perception that Jesus has in this is a true perception. There's something that they're doing that is communicating to him, hey, you don't love me and you don't love other people like you used to. What's gotten in the way? What are we involved in with our time, with our attention, with our affection? Have you ever, and I don't, I don't like to, I'm not judging, but have you ever looked at, well, I'll just say, for instance, like the other day, we were, we, uh, Grayson had a wrestling tournament. At, was it 7 o'clock in the morning, Heather? It was 7 o'clock in the morning, like 800 people in the stands already. <laughs> 7 o'clock in the morning. Seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> like, whoa, okay. <laughs> and and locked and engaged and and, and and there for it, you know. I think I'm the only one like, man, I'm ready to go home, you know. But <laughs> but engage and and commit it. And I would never compare that with a with church service, but when something has your affection, attention, your time, you give it your all. Does that make sense? And this is where we've got to gauge when it's doing something for the kingdom or if it's spending time with God, what does that look like? Is it 7 o'clock in the morning? How many ever woke up at 7 o'clock in the morning and said, God, I'm just going to, before I do anything, I'm just going to spend 10 minutes with you. I'm just going to spend 10 minutes with you. Before I leave this house, go to work, go to school, I'm going to spend some time with you. But what happens is we're running late, we're busy, we got things to do, right? And we, we pull up you version on the way at the house and read a scripture. And that equates to us spending time with God. Y'all tracking with me? Amen or ouch, God, this is what God's dealing with me, so I'm not... I'm going through it as well. Trust me. How far have you fallen? Second thing, he says, turn back to me. Everybody say, turn back. He says, turn back to me and do the works you did at first. And he says, turn back. Have you ever been engaged in a conversation with somebody and you did not have their attention? But they tried to fake it and you knew? So the other day, I'm doing something. My daughter, when she tells a story, she, she, she's a storyteller. She's so good that you will believe every story she tells you. I think that's a gift she has. The way she communicates. And I remember we even got in trouble. Not got in trouble, but I think one of our t the teachers ran into Heather and like, hey, is, it, is Adonis okay? And Heather's like, yeah, well, what's going on? And Carrington proceeded to tell her this story that we went on vacation and yeah, we went to the beach and, and daddy got bit by a shark and she believed it. Like, Carrington is telling every detail. Every single detail. So when she's telling you a story, she wants your attention. And the other day, I'm, she's wanting to tell me something that, that happened at school and it's a good story and I'm sitting there on my computer, Karen, in the chair, I'm like, Carrington's right here, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, Carrington, yeah, I'm okay, let, just keep going. My hands are going, and she's like, Dad, you're, you're, not, you're not listening to me. No, Carrington, I hear you, just go ahead. So she stops again, Dad, you're not listening. Carrington, and now, Carrington, I'm listening, just go ahead and tell me. Finally, you know what she did? She grabbed my face, and she says, I need you to look at me. 
And I wonder how many times is God (laughs) trying to grab our face, saying, I need you to look at me. Because we can come in here and go through the motions and never look at God. We can go out through our entire week and never, we can read scripture on you version. We can do everything. We can, we can meet up for coffee and call that discipleship, and we will never look at God. Never take the time. Karen said, grab my face. I need you. Like she was frustrated. I need you to look at me. And what did I do when she did that? Close that computer. <laughs> what I did, turned and I looked, and she went on to tell me her story. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit convicted me, not just for ignoring my daughter, <laughs> but how many times do I go throughout my day never looking at God, never taking the moment? Have you ever been out? Somewhere in the beautiful scenery, what do you do? You stop. And you're like, let me take all this in. You do. But how many times on a daily basis are we not looking at God? When he says, turn back, we've got to turn. We've got to look at him once again. Then he goes on to say, I need you to do this. I need you to do those first works. Y'all remember those? The first works you did. Now, now, that's not complicated. When he goes, go back and do those things that you did at first. Everybody say at first. And every now and then, we got to take a trip down memory lane and go back and do those things. When we first met God, what was our relationship like with him? When we first had that experience with God, what was our relationship first like with him? Do those first works. I remember when I first got saved, I first had an experience with God, man. God was all I talked about. I didn't worry about if somebody's going to think, man, he's being obnoxious. Or he's a Jesus freak. I remember that. I'm kind of dating myself way back then. I remember first works, and I'm looking at, you know, uh, that was like, what, 17, 18, I was 17 years of age when I, when I first had an experience with God. Now, my life has gone through ups and downs, and, and, but I've stayed committed to God. But the works that I do now don't reflect those first works that I did. Y'all tracking? If I were to be honest, those first works that I did, some of those first works, you know, I think about my youth pastor uh, who lives in... in uh, Brownsville, Texas, by the name of Bill Moore, uh, just uh, a, a huge God's figure in my life. And when I first got saved, he was my youth pastor. And when it, it, his idea of discipleship, you want to know what that was? It wasn't, hey, guys, let's, let's meet up for coffee, because we didn't do coffee back then. His was, hey, jump in the car. We're going to go down to the mall, and I'm going to teach you guys how to witness to people. That was, that was his discipleship with us. These teenage boys, he said, hey, get in my, my car, my vi- minivan. He had a minivan, so he's real, he's rocking youth pastor. <laughs> had a minivan. We loaded up in the minivan, and he's like, we're going to go down here, and you're basically going to tell people what it was like to meet Jesus. I'm like, Bill, I, I, we don't know what to say. No, God's going to give you the words to say. You're talking about putting somebody on the spot. And he was like, hey, listen, this is what being a Christian is all about. We don't have a lot of time. We've got to tell as many people about Jesus. And he took us down. I don't know if anybody knows anything about San Antonio, Texas. There was a mall called Windsor Park Mall in San Antonio, Texas. Danny, you know, right? Yeah. Ned shut down, you know. (laughs) Windsor Park Mall was a happening mall. All these teenagers would hang out there. Uh, Some gangs would hang out there. And that's the mall he took us to. Took us to that mall, said, we're going to get out. And not only are we going to get out, but we're going to split up. But this is your assignment. He said, go find a group of young people, get their attention, and tell them about Jesus. He would always have something else that we could invite them to or come, come hang out with us here. 
But I remember we did that like every Saturday. We're going and witnessing to people. Strangers. Gang members. But you know what? I felt God with me in that moment. I loved God so much. I just wanted to be pleasing to him. And I loved him so much I wanted to tell other people about him. You know, when I met Heather and fell in love with her, I didn't, I didn't have to take a, a, a class on how to tell people I loved her. Y'all tracking with me? And I think sometimes we complicate what can be so simple, just going back to those first words. And that's a journey that each one of us can take on our own. I don't know what your first works were like, but I think it's time to go back and maybe revisit some of those. If we're going to stay on track with the way the world's going right now, Jesus said the love of many will grow cold because of what's going on in our world. But this is where we've got to stay on fire. Everybody say fire. We've got to stay passionate about our relationship with God. Do those first works and tell people about Jesus. But that's how he broke us in. That was, that was our discipleship. What was he basically doing? He was doing what Jesus said, come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Hey, boys, get in the van. We're going to drive down here, and we're going to go fishing for Jesus. Fourth thing he says, he's got to repent. Everybody say repent. Yes. Now, you know, that word, uh, as I begin to, to look at that, how many ever repented? Like, God, I'm sorry. Or he asked for forgiveness. Okay? So, Oftentimes, when we get off track, we, we talk about drifting. Remember we talked about drifting, how we drift away? How many know that's a period of time that we can drift? You don't drift away in one day, but it's a period of time that, that we drift away from God, and we drift away from those first works because of things that have come into our life and different stages of life. How many know different stages of life require us to reassess and make sure that we're still keeping God first. Because at the end of the day, even, you know, Jesus Christ, I think I said this last week, but he will take second place to no one or nothing. And there's going to be people coming to your life, whether you're married, have kids, you're going you're gonna to love them. But hey, wait a minute. Jesus said, if you love them more than me, uh-oh, don't get mad at me. I didn't say that. That's what the word of God says. You, you, you. You can't put anybody before Christ. But we have to make some adjustments and make sure that our relationship with God is staying vibrant and passionate. When you hear that word repent, I looked it up, I did this in Hebrew. How many like Hebrew? A few of you? Yes, the language. <laughs> so in Hebrew, it means, I'm going to see if I can get this right, tish. Teshuva. Everybody say teshuva. Teshuva. The word repent translated into teshuva. But it literally means this, to return as if turning back to something you've strayed or looked away from. Now, teshuva is the central theme of time between Rosh Hashanah, you have to look these up on your own, and Yom Kippur, known collectively as the 10 days, everybody say 10 days, of teshuva. 10 days of repentance. 10 days of being focused on turning back to God. That's intentional. That is not a, okay, God, I'm sorry I've been neglecting you. Forgive me. That is a process. Everybody say process. That is a process. This was a 10-day period where people focused on repenting, turning back to God. Because if we were really honest, I mean, you know, sometimes it's like going through a closet that you just, you got to pull some layers off. You got to get rid of some stuff. You may have to correct one action at a time. But it was a 10-day process, a journey of turning back towards God and getting back on track. 
Jesus said this. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me. Do those first works and repent. I mean, that's, if we could just lock in on that, that is, that, is, that is a process for all of us to take home beyond this, this sermon today and apply that to our lives. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me. Do those first works. Just repent. Get on this, this 10-day track of, okay, I'm going to dedicate the next 10 days to assess in my life. Where is my relationship with God compared to where it used to be? What are the things that I need to start doing to get back to that passionate pursuit I had of Christ? Amen? Amen. Then he goes on to verse 6, and I'm getting ready to close this out. Verse 6, he says, but this is in your favor. Now, he's kind of like sandwiched it. He started out with good, then he body slammed him, but then he goes on to say, but this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the uh, Nicolaitans, just as I do. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand, understand what he is saying. And I think it's in those moments, Patrick talked about earlier, when you get in God's presence and you start listening, this is not a God saying, thou art the man. But this is a God saying, hey, thou art the man, thou art the woman. Here's some things I need you to do. And if we steady ourselves and quiet ourselves and give God opportunity to speak to us, I believe he will, and he'll put us on track. There's so many things, you know. Sometimes I just, I, I can be frustrated when I see what goes on in the world. And God's dealing with me on that. And I think some of that is like, have you ever just wanted everybody to love God as much as you did? I mean, that's just, but I mean, no, that's not the reality that we live in. You ever get frustrated when you, you know, with me, I think of one of the big things that I really get frustrated with and I'm trying to find that balance. It's like, I feel like there's so much that's going to our younger generation every single day through this, through this platform of social media. And I feel like it's, especially with my kids, it's like, you know, they, they get mad at me and, me and Heather because it's like we keep them on lockdown with their phones. My son's like, Dad, I don't even have social media. And, you know, but it's like, I get so frustrated, and I almost feel like, man, if, if this world would just fall in love with God, everything would be better. But I mean, no, that's never going to happen. And I'll get frustrated. I'll have a tendency to the love for other people to grow cold. It's like, man, you just, how could you do that, you know? So it's like, this is a journey God's taken me on, and I'm, I'm not there yet, guys, but... I'm making a strive to get back to those first works, that first relationship with God. It's a journey, but I think it's one that God's called all of us to do. Amen? Get back to the first works. Get back to those first works. Does this help anybody today? Yeah. It's a... I'm going to get the band back up real quickly. and we're, we're, I never get through my notes. I don't know what's going on here. But <laughs> I'm trying not to close this much. But I still got, I still got first John. Let me, well, can, can I read one more scripture? Yeah. Let, me read, let me read one more scripture. This is, and then we'll, we'll get back into this next week too. First John 2. This is, you know, uh, it's all the, all the love stuff that goes on. But I want to I wanna close with Verse 15. Grace, if you can put that up, First John 2. Go to the, the slide that has the number 15. There you go. Ooh, my son's on it. He's like, Dad, you tried to throw me a curveball. <laughs> First John 2, 15. And I'm going to close with this. I'm going to get the band back up. I think we've got to make a decision. 
There's, there's so much out there that could be enticing. But this is where we've got to look at God. We've got to, we've got to look at God in the midst of everything that's going on. And 1 John 2.15 says this. I'm going to close with this. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the Father's love is not in him. For everything that is in the world does not come from the Father. The desires of our flesh and the things our eyes see and want and the pride of this life come from the world. The world and all its desires will pass away. The man or woman who obeys God and does what he wants done will live forever. That's a decision. And I know sometimes it could be fighting that balance of enjoying some things on this earth. You ever get confused sometimes? Like, okay, I, I do love going out and doing that. And, but, and I don't think any of that's bad, but I think it gets out of order for us if we're Christ followers if we love something else more than loving God. Does that make sense? And I think that's the journey that we have to go on as an individual in our lives and make sure nothing is taking that space in our heart that belongs to, to God and God alone. And I do believe that God loves us so much when we get off track and we start loving something more than him, then that, that he's say, hey, that was not worth it. It's not judgmental. Say, hey, Patrick, not worth the man. It's like, hey, Noah, not worth the man. But it's us being in those moments, allowing God to speak to us in such a way. Like, oh, wow. See now. And when we turn and look towards Him, is when we see. That empowers us to make the course correction that we need to stay in love with Him. Amen. Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence today. And Lord God, I just thank you that even as we close out today's message that it doesn't just stop here but Lord God that we can we can leave this place we can still reflect on your scripture we can stay in your presence and do those things that you told us to do in Revelation 2 Lord God you told us to to turn back to you to see how far we've fallen to do those first works that we did when we first met you to go on that journey of repentance by saying, God, I'm sorry. It's, it's not just lip service, but it's, I'm going to change some stuff on the inside. I'm going to change some behavior, some attitudes. I'm going to change some habits that are going to put me in a better position to love you with everything. We declare that today, Lord God. We thank you. In Jesus' name.